Okay, uh, so apologies for the uh, late start. Yet again, uh, these days is always a little, more, little bit more complicated and I appreciate the uh, the accommodation for my uh, getting started a couple of minutes late. So um, today we're uh, going to be uh, working towards wrapping up the course with a uh, particularly uh, important topic in the broader landscape of modeling. And specifically, we're going to be uh, speaking about a topic which, uh, which uh, addresses issues across modeling types, and in fact is focused on weaving together those modeling types. Forgive me, uh, there's some noise outside the classroom, so I'm gonna need to shut the door here. Okay, uh, so hopefully that will um, that will cut down on the noise a little bit. Uh, so, as I said, uh, today we're going to be dealing with an issue which cuts across modeling types and uh, which weaves them together. It's the topic of of hybrid system science methods. These are methods which draw on uh, not just one of a set of uh, the common prevalent system science modeling types, agent-based modeling, uh, discrete event simulation, system dynamics or compartmental modeling, but rather uh, draw on several of them and, and weave them together. Now, these techniques have been in the background uh, for much of the course. Indeed, uh, quite a large fraction of the models which uh, we've worked with in this class have had elements in them uh, that, that demonstrate this, this hybrid approach. Um, and they do so for good reason, because hybrid approaches turn out to offer us uh, a great deal of extra insight, a great deal of extra um, flexibility in, in addressing our modeling needs, and particularly flexibility of learning as we model, allowing us to shift between different modeling approaches as our learning develops, as our understanding of what level of detail is needed for different areas of a model, and uh, as new questions come to us, either from uh, regarding interventions or regarding the nature of the system. So these hybrid modeling techniques uh, uh, allow us a requisite flexibility in supporting multiple types of modeling. Um, pardon me. Uh, multiple types of modeling in a way that uh, supports an evolution of the modeling process as learning continues. Now, today we're gonna be discussing the sort of hybrid modeling with a frame of agent-based modeling. And there's a good reason for that. It turns out that agent-based modeling, more so than the other two methods, provides a sort of natural gluing together of multiple sorts of modeling. And that's particularly true because of agent-based modeling support for, uh, for multi-scale and, uh, and sort of, uh, compartmentalized or, or uh, modularized modeling. Uh, so um, I'm going to be providing in today's lecture, a glimpse of a set of different approaches, predominantly five different approaches for weaving together different types of dynamic modeling with a particular emphasis on those related to agent-based modeling. And uh, we're going to be doing so while looking at particular models that serve as uh, examples or even exemplars uh, of these, these types of hybrid approaches. Okay, so um, with that preface, I'd like to dive in to some of the slides, which are posted uh, for those interested in it in a uh, in a PDF called hands-on hybrid modeling, okay? 
and uh, we're going to be alternating as we often do between slides on the one hand and uh, closer looks uh, at the at the exemplar models on the other. Okay, um, so in in my view, as someone who for about 30 years now has been applying multiple system science approaches. Um, uh, an important starting point for talking about hybrid modeling is to observe that different system science modeling methodologies, different complex systems modeling methodologies, you can pick your wording, um, far from being competitors that seek to replace each other or vie for model or allegiance uh, as the way of describing situation, the different modeling methodologies genuinely seek to, to address uh, questions in ways that are, that are different and often different questions. Um, uh, the, their foremost distinction in my view is not so much um, the particular language by which they describe the modeling, the particular formalisms they use, the visual representations, as important as those are, as rich as those are. It's the types of questions they ask. Um, and often the formalisms, the kind of building blocks and how we weave them together into models emerge from those questions. So the types of questions that are often driving or motivating uh, or, or uh, seek, seek to serve as the sort of central goals of a discrete event simulation project, for example, will often be very different from those uh, for an agent-based modeling project and different yet from those for, for system dynamics projects. And um, while you will find no shortage of partisans, from each tradition seeking to establish the unique superiority, the privilege of that tradition over the others. Um, I can assure you from decades of, of authentic work with, uh, uh, with the, uh, all three traditions and from attempts to use different traditions to examine uh, problems in similar areas, the no one system science method is a replacement for the others. They each offer unique advantages and they each offer trade-offs related to the others that, that mean that it'll be a fool's errand to seek to, to totally replace one by others. That doesn't mean you won't find attempts. You'll find you know, researchers in certain quarters claiming that agent-based modeling really replaces system dynamics modeling and discrete event simulation, that it's, you know, that it's algorithmic nature means that we don't need equation-based modeling before. Or you'll find people claiming that discrete event simulation can do everything agent-based modeling does, and, and therefore we don't really need agent-based modeling packages. In my mind, those, those claims lack authenticity uh, and often they lack the, those who advance them having genuine authentic depth of experience in multiple traditions. And often they ignore practicalities and deal with sort of theoretic, um, theoretic interchangeability. Um, so it is um, very clear to me having, practiced, uh, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of, in some cases, over a hundred projects in, in some of these traditions that no one replaces another. But what, I'm, what I wanna to emphasize today is the fact that significant synergies can be secured by combinations of them. And it's not merely that these are marriages of convenience, that these are matters of, um, of you know, uh, cleverly weaving things together in a in an amusing way that's intellectually satisfying. Um, no, it's it's 
that at a genuine level, you get a whole greater than the sum of the parts. You achieve from the hybrid model something that would be genuinely very, very difficult to achieve from either piece and where it's really the combination of the pieces that often yield real insight. Now, some of these, some of these elements um, uh, you may recall from, from past discussions here. Um, and indeed, we'll see some of those models we explored previously um, are showcased as exemplars of these methods. Uh, I do have a, probably a good two dozen other hybrid method uh, hybrid models for those interested. But uh, the fact is that it's by combining methods that we achieve often greater insight. And it isn't just that the insights flow from the model with greater profusion because we brought together these techniques. It's often the modeling process that that secures the benefit. It's the ability to proceed with greater smoothness, with less lurching back and forth um, uh, with changing our models. Uh, it's the ability to, to nimbly adjust model structure as our understanding of the situation in the world, the priorities to which were pointed by stakeholders or as, as a situation in the world evolved. Uh, so uh, I'll try to highlight some of these synergies uh, in today's talk um, and, and speak about the way that they transcend, these particular methods transcend either of the approaches. Now I've recognized that my computer right now should be plugged in and uh, I don't wanna risk it shutting down in the midst of, of today's, uh, today's lecture. So. Give me just a moment, and uh, I had neglected this task, and I'll get it get it powered up here. Okay. Great. Thank you for your accommodation. And I think to complete the picture, I'm going to get my glasses on, or at least have them handy. Okay. So. Um, we're going to be handling in this lecture a particular set of discrete ways, particular specific ways in which we combine multiple methods. And hopefully we'll see these, these broader principles emerge uh, through it with some clarity. Although the, the difference, the, the particulars of that will be different from case to case. So a few motivations for hybrid modeling as I see them. And again, this is based on uh, what is now dozens of models built for this sort for research insight beyond the, the many built for teaching purposes. Um, so one thing is a matter of comparative advantage. Um, it turns out that certain processes are simpler to describe in one tradition than another. So if you're dealing with resource constrained flow through some sort of structured workflow, discrete event simulation just can't be beat. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic. Uh, if you're interested in capturing aspects of agent-agent interaction um, at, a, at, a, at a finer grand level, um, or interested in capturing aspects of implementation intervention, uh, of intervention implementation, or components associated with with uh, interaction of agents uh, in networks or situated in geographic space. Agent-based modeling is exquisitely uh, effective. If you're dealing with dynamics of continuous quantities, uh, you know of of reservoir levels or level of pathogen in in uh, in, in um, external environment, uh, let's say cholera in, um, in aqueous environments. If you're dealing with uh, stocks of, of, of vaccine and dynamics associated with uh, changes in the amount of material uh, available, system dynamics has amazing um, 
amazingly uh, effective, concise, expressive, transparent ways of representing such matters. So often these methods each have a particular sphere in which they shine in terms of their expressiveness, their conciseness, their transparency to stakeholders. But often you'll find within a given model, within different spheres of a model, there's different questions or different needs that arise. So maybe your model has a public health side associated with spread of infection or or risk behaviors and protective practices related to, to uh, risk of, of chronic, uh, chronic conditions or comorbidities. And, and yet there's also a service delivery side which um, exists where a lot of the concern is about resourcing levels and waiting times and waiting lists and prioritization schemes. Uh, these different spheres um, sort of uh, invite different types of lenses and different types of description. And we might use agent-based modeling for the first of them. We might use discrete event simulation, for example, for the latter, um, in a way that would be very, very insightful. With discrete event simulation, you could, you could look at resource utilization profiles and how they change over time. You could nimbly and, and, and very rapidly experiment with different resourcing levels or placement of resources and space and really gain a great deal of insight while also um, dealing with, with matters that are simultaneously upstream and downstream on the, on the public health side. Another matter is, is one I, I alluded to earlier. It's a matter of adaptivity. So modeling, uh, I argued on the first day of this class, um, is best viewed as a type of learning. I spoke about the view of models as learning prostheses, just as when we break our leg or our foot, we use physical prostheses, crutches, cane, boots, et cetera, to allow us to achieve near full functionality despite our physical limitations. Modeling lets us do that with our cognitive limitations. It's a way to allow us to achieve much greater functionality despite our cognitive limitations. And a key component of this um, was the principle that modeling is learning. Modeling is a way of, of extending our cognition so we can learn more quickly, more deeply, more reliably based on observations from the world and trying things out in the model and realizing that our way of thinking about it is kind of broken and, and we're overlooking some things, we're oversimplifying others. And, and it's the fact that we could take models and try them out and test them out that allows us to learn more effectively. So models, it's, it's not so much the model, but the modeling that's most important. It's so not that the model, as I said many times, embodies the truth, rather, it provides us a way to speed us towards the truth for discovering those cherished misconceptions that are misplaced. Um, and a key component of this is that we learn over time and our models learn with us. We, we revise our models. And so there's a need to evolve the model often along with our learning. And this poses challenges when we have models only in one tradition because there may be elements of the situation now clear to us, the importance of networks, the importance of, of interventions that, that target things based on people's network position, the importance of beneath the skin factors as well as above the skin factors, the, uh, the importance of, of geographic risk factors in, in terms of social determinants of health, that that really need to be represented and which we had which we had previously left out of the model. So we start simple, 
And we learn over time, oh, maybe we need this in there, or, or this needs to be refined. We need to change the representation of that. We need to deal with, you know, dynamics of supply availability. And as we learn, often our sense of, of what approach to use for different areas of the model will evolve. Maybe we start with a simple aggregate compartmental system dynamics characterization of, of uh, the treatment process. And we discover that really at the heart of a lot of our needs is a representation that would capture resource constraints and would capture uh, more effectively an understanding of resource placement um, that that comes to the fore. And in that case, you know, a discrete event simulation for that area of the model might be called for. So our models, we learn in modeling and our models need to learn along with us. They need to adapt along with us. And different areas of the model may evolve in terms of what modeling approach is most natural for them. And it turns out that using hybrid modeling, the ability to weave together allows you to change the boundary. What's what's undertaken in an individual level model versus an aggregate model versus a DES model, for example. Um, maybe initially it's all aggregate. Maybe at some point you decide once people become infected, we'll represent them at an individual level so we could follow their care trajectory. And, and then maybe at some point, because of some of the questions that come about the about their episodes of care and their care pathways, we need a DES model somewhere in there while they're under uh, acute care. And uh, then at some point we decide we need to better represent the contact tracing process at an individual level. And so we represent a broader swath of the population at an individual level. Adaptivity is often key for nimble response as our learning evolves, as the external world evolves, as our stakeholder requests evolve. A further issue at a practical level that often comes up in real modeling projects is the fact that different of our stakeholders for the modeling have different needs. And um, if you're dealing with demographers, often a high level aggregate stock and flow model will speak to their way of thinking about the world very fruitfully and address many of their questions. By contrast, if you are dealing with clinicians, often their way of thinking about the world is very individual based and the research questions they bring to the fore are individual based. And if you are trying in the human theater of, of modeling, um, to make resp models responsive to the questions being advanced by stakeholders. Often we really want to understand what form of modeling resonates with and speaks to the needs of our stakeholders, builds confidence about the model by our stakeholders, addresses their needs for insight. And which form it is may not be obvious at the start of a project, especially if new stakeholders come over, come on during the project, which you know has been a reality for many of our projects. So here, you know, different regions of the model might be best uh, characterized, specified in different modeling methodologies. Another very pragmatic factor that comes in with modeling projects is concerns computational efficiency. Agent-based modeling is extremely powerful, but it is computationally expensive. Um, although the first agent-based models were crafted in the 1940s and 50s with John von Neumann and, and Stanislaw Ulam, uh, uh, the fact is that this method came to the fore um, really for, for health modeling in the 2000s because of the greater availability of computational methods. Um, and, and a very real trade-off that needs to be weighed is what, what level of computational burden are we willing to put up with uh, in our models? 
because slow models mean slower learning cycles. Uh, and there's a need to pragmatically determine what, how much detail are we going to go into in a given area of the model in a way that reflects how long it will take to run. The final thing I'll, I'll say here uh, concerns multi-scale modeling. And, and the, the fact is that often these days, when we're dealing with situations in the world, when we're re reasoning about breaking the cycle of addiction, for example, that, um, that is associated with many substance use problems, or when we're dealing with uh, immune dynamics as it affects vulnerability of the population to COVID-19, flu, and, immuno and RSV, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, or if we're dealing with aspects associated with um, ensuring uh, gestational diabetes uh, is managed effectively and understanding the consequences of different uh, re treatment regimens, both for the mother and, and for the baby. Um, Multi-scale modeling, modeling that goes beneath the skin as well as has public health and potentially health service components along the lines is of great value. We have uh, quite a few published um, uh, published uh, pieces of work that are tripartite models. We've together all three of the major approaches, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, so stock and flow modeling, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation. And they do so in many cases because we want to capture physiological dynamics at some level, including immune system function, uh, uh, dynamics, say, at a health service level and dynamics at a public health level. It turns out um, often uh, the need for multiple scales of analysis is very important. So I'm presenting this lecture in agent-based modeling course, um, not merely because agent-based modeling is a kind of a bystander to hybrid modeling, that it's one of several approaches. It, in my view, it often um, is the one that is, it, it, it's the most common one to be involved in these hybrid combinations for a good reason. Um, first of all, ABMs provide multi-scale, support for multi-scale modeling when they're implemented in certain ways that just isn't there in the other two approaches in contemporary techniques. We're working to, to alter that in some of our categorical modeling work, compositional modeling, but, but multi-scale modeling is fairly readily supported in agent-based modeling. You can carve off part of the dynamics as an agent, for example, within an agent. And uh, Nasturan knows it in, in some of her modeling, you can have, for example, different agents representing different disease processes for a person. Uh, or you could have different agents representing dynamics, um, endocrine dynamics during pregnancy or outside of pregnancy captured as, as agents within an agent, multi-scale modeling. But ABMs offer also are kind of have this requisite generality to interface with, with system dynamics models, um, often quite um, on quite a uh, a good basis. It's it's it they they can often um, have a, a very nice tight fit with system dynamics um, and with DES. They have. The commonality that both are, so this is discrete event simulation, both are individual level tradition and they, they really work together well. So those were some motivations for hybrid modeling. And I commented on sort of the, uh, in my view, it, it comes close to being a, a, a keystone role um, that ABM plays, or you could might might be excused for thinking about it, agent-based models forming a keystone species within the within the uh, the ecosystem of hybrid modeling. They're 
they're, they're a very prominent tradition in hybrid modeling for good reason. I now want to turn to the particulars, and I want to talk about five uh, compelling hybrid modeling patterns that come up. But I, I want to do more than talk about them. I want to show them, right? Um, so this is where we're going to go back and forth between uh, theory and, and particular models. And the first one I want to talk about is her Lewis Carroll, the one at the start, service population interaction. And the idea here is that we have some representation of a resource contained a constrained service process. Maybe it's clinics handling patients who come in. Maybe it's applications for social assistance for housing, for social housing. Maybe it's um, uh, people seeking to, uh, or, or people in a queue for contact tracing, for example. There's some service be it clinical or public health or social service or criminal justice. Uh, and it's resource constrained. So it's constrained by availability of judges and prosecutors and, and legal aid and, um, and availability of court clerks for legal processes. Or in, in a clinic, it's associated with you know, uh, uh, it's it's resource constrained by availability of uh, physicians and nurses and diagnostic imaging machines in rooms or something along those lines. So we have this resource constrained service delivery, and we have a population out there in the world that, over time, may need those services, and they. They come in for those services. They engage with the services for either a longer or shorter time, and then they leave. And so we have health services or, or legal services or social services interact with population. And we can weave them together. And agent-based modeling is used for the broader population and discrete event simulation is used for the resource-constrained services. So let's go open a model like that. You've actually seen it before. We'll look at it from a different angle. There's many others that I was thinking about sharing with you um, that illustrate this, uh, but I rather like the one we had and, and it has a degree of familiarity. So let me close out uh, these models here and we will open up uh, the the model uh, at hand. So it's multi-clinic SAS hybrid saturation effects and lock and version three, indeed, version three. Okay, so I am going to uh, get that on my side and I'd invite you to download it. Oh, I should have told you, yes. Should have told you that for today, I actually built a hybrid section of this website. Now I didn't put all the hybrid methods models that I've already shared with you in there. There'll be a lot more. I focus on the ones that I'm actually planning to open and lecture, but there's a lot more uh, in the collection of models up, up there. Um, uh, and for example, this GDM one, gestational diabetes uh, is, a, is a hybrid one. There's a uh, this, this GIS food environment one is a hybrid one, but these are the ones we want to focus on. So here's this multi-clinic SAS hybrid, and I'll go, I'll go open it uh, up on, on my computer here. Okay. Um, right. Uh, oh, um, okay. So I guess I moved it into the hybrid area. Fair enough, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so um, people will be will probably recall this, which is one of the reasons I used it. I, I don't have to introduce as much. So we, we have the main environment and the main environment has 
as an age-based model, a set of populations. In this case, it's a population of homes, clinics, and, and people. And uh, people live in homes, but persons can develop illness. And it's a treatment-mediated recovery situation where uh, they go through a set of states uh, which can leave them in an infective and symptomatic state, but in order to recover, they, they require treatment. And um, I've noted before that uh, conditions such as gonorrhea or chlamydia, um, uh, can much of them are, are, are treatment mediated for, for recovery, uh, particularly for asymptomatic individuals with gonorrhea, for example. Although there's there's also some natural recovery that does go on. Here it's purely treatment mediated. And reflecting their evolution of health status on the left here, they can be in a care seeking state. So they can either be not seeking care in transit to care or under care. And the key point here is when they present to care, so so they're going to seek to seek out care when they are infective and symptomatic. So an individual will head out for care if and only if they're infective and symptomatic. It's under those conditions, this little loop sort of gets them checking this and, and periodically, um, so, so once uh, every half a day, they, they consider whether they, they need care, so to speak. In any case, they, they will seek out care if they are infective and symptomatic, in which case they will move to the nearest clinic. They'll get the nearest agent of the clinics to them in space. And they will then head there. They will then move to said clinic. And by so moving, they will approach the clinic, and once they arrive at the clinic, they will then enter the clinic. They will walk into the clinic. And this may seem odd sort of phrasing, but in that clinic to which they are headed, um, if they say to it, hey, take me, take me in, take me on. Um, and uh, and so they're they're interfacing with this and it, they're saying, take me into your workflow. And so that's what the clinic does. Um, and they come in and then they wait. And if it's too long a wait with a timeout of 300 minutes, they will balk and they will leave without being seen. That's this upper one here. Uh, by contrast, um, if they are treated within their uh, amount of time uh, stipulated. They will proceed on and, and be treated with uh, uh, requiring between half an hour and 1.5 hours overall. Uh, and uh, the, clin the, the treatment is successful with a certain probability. And if it is successful, it, the, the cure will be administered to the patient, so to speak. So this patient will be notified or you know, the, the patient will have themselves cured by, and the way in which that's captured as a computational mechanism is that a cured message is sent to them. And they then, um, they then move back to the susceptible state. By contrast, if it's unsuccessful, um, they will not be cured and they'll go back home, but will need to seek care again at some later time. So that's the idea. Now, one component I haven't stressed is um, there, this whole flow is, is resource limited. So their ability to go down here, how long they wait, will be dictated in large part by the fact that here they need to proceed a healthcare worker to be assigned to them. And there's only so many healthcare workers available. 
So if that healthcare worker isn't available um, within 300 minutes, right there, uh, so within five hours, they will leave. Otherwise, they'll continue on. So this healthcare worker, the availability of that healthcare worker is, is key. If they're the first person in that day and the healthcare worker is free, they can breeze through here, be treated, hopefully successfully, and leave. And upon departure, they um, they they leave in a way that will bring them home um, with this uh, departed departed clinic message. By contrast, if they have come in and the clinic is already crowded, they may wait four hours. If they wait over five hours, they'll leave for this healthcare worker. And uh, initially, the healthcare workers are by default set to just be a number of healthcare workers per clinic as set by a parameter in Maine. Okay, so, so here we have a clinic. Here we have a person and a population. And in fact, there's a population of people, but also a population of clinics. And so there's this interplay between what's going on in the population in terms of spread of infection from an infective person. It can spread to others in the population while they're in the population in this need for care as captured by the clinic. And if a clinic is really slow, it will mean fewer people are treated over time. People stay infected for longer and they spread the infection to more, which will lead to more demand for the clinic. If public health measures are successful in the community, it may mean less demand for clinic services, which will mean those who do have to present will secure care sooner, will be less likely to leave without being seen to bulk and, and therefore be, be cured sooner and will aid, um, aid uh, keeping the infection numbers low with the population. So you have this coupled process of of resource constrained service flow in the clinic on the one hand uh, and public health concerns in the population on the other. And you have questions that might be posed on both. You could ask in the population about effective interventions on the prevention side or early detection side, et cetera. In the clinic, uh, you could ask about the level of staffing that are needed or how many clinics or where we should place them in the community, how long people are waiting, the length of the waiting time, um, the design of the clinic workflow, as it were, um, uh, factors involving the types of, of, uh, of treatment conferred that might, that might offer a better chance of, of successful treatment or discover treatment failure earlier in order to, to, uh, to, to allow a person to be uh, successfully treated. So there are these coupled processes. Let's go run this model we were. We've seen this before, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. We, we use this model to illustrate amongst other things, um, the, uh, the impacts of, of changing parameter values, for example, and, and parameter sensitivity analysis. So here we start with some numbers of people uh, in this state of, of exposure. And here are the clinics. There's, there's one clinic here in the population. And so everyone's going to go to that, that clinic there. And, and once they become in, infective and symptomatic, they're gonna be presenting for care in the clinic. And of course we can go Oops, we can go look at the clinic here and I'll slow this down a bit. Um, but we can see, for example, there's one healthcare worker, only about 10% in demand and there's people presenting for care and virtually all of them have gone and, and gone through the, the, the treatment pathway. Um, no one yet has left without being seen. You can see these counts of the number that have come in and left via certain pathways here. So right now it's it's looking pretty good, 
but we see that there are people in the population who are infected and they are spreading the infection to others uh, at their homes, for example. Uh, here we have uh, a count of, of, of illnesses. This is the clinic, as I understand, this is the clinic, um, uh, the clinic utilization and so on. Uh, but right now, it looks like it's fairly under control. And in fact, the infection died out this time. So, so we narrowly uh, averted a, a spread of uh, infection, but now this other run, it goes into an adverse state. There's a lock-in effect and the population is in bad shape. The clinic is totally maxed out with the healthcare workers and the vast majority of people are leaving without being seen. Um, of the total of about 100,000 people that came in, over 95% of them have left without being seen. Um, uh, only about less than 5% have, have proceeded. Um, and as a result, they're gonna be spreading infection in the community a lot more. So you've seen elements of that before. I don't, I don't have to talk about it much, but turns out this is a extraordinarily common need and one which um, has been very fruitful in our lines of research across multiple types of, of projects. One of our earliest publications in it was this one on, on tripartite uh, health model architecture. Um, but uh, there was a, a, a later follow-on paper in Nephron, I think, um, to the American Society of Nephrology. Um, so, this interplay between a population and a clinic is a is a common one. And um, you know, as I've noted, they can address these joint questions on service types, availability of certain types of service, for example, counseling, behavioral counseling for an STI clinic or a, a dental clinic, for example. Um, how does service quality affect representation? A key issue across Canada for for um, the interface between acute care and, and uh, community care, for example. Um, but it can also allow us to look at how interventions at the population level affect service demand, right? Um, and vice versa. Um, and how wait times affect demand dynamics. Um, so uh, compared to pure ABM, it's, it's really far easier to capture and change assumptions regarding service delivery with DES. DS is not a tradition that I've had time to cover. It's another rich tradition. Um, and uh, I was hoping I might be able to have a lecture on it, but, but time has, has, has run low for that. And you'll find other lectures of me speaking about discrete about simulation modeling. And one of the things you'll find is that the language of discrete event simulation, the special language illustrated here and available um, in uh, the, the palette, any logic for process modeling library. It's really um, concise, expressive, and uh, very transparent and, and, and uh, quite modular for characterizing uh, service delivery uh, resource constrained service delivery. Um, and it can do so in ways that uh, are quite flexible for the types of service needs and um, types of, of uh, dependencies they have on resources. Um, and that's a set of questions we can ask about resource placement, uh, treat availability, and its impact on throughput, the number of people treated per day, impact on how quickly people move through the latency, impact on aspects of waiting time and waiting list length, et cetera, um, and utilization of, of resources. So you can have many types of resources, healthcare workers, doctors, uh, you know, rooms um, for treatment, and examine how does, how does resourcing at that level impact all of this in a way that could be done with age-based modeling, but with a lot more work a lot more effort, a lot of code. This is a, a very 
um, expressive and an elegant way of, of capturing it. Uh, it also compares favorably to capturing it in system dynamics, uh, which can be done again, but with with more method. Um, so why not each method alone? Well, discrete event modeling is just not a very effective tradition for capturing people out there in the community, interacting with each other, spreading infections, et cetera, moving around with, with mobility in the community. Um, it can be hard to characterize certain types of key processes for population health. And age-based modeling is it's cumbersome and, and sort of requires a lot of work to, to represent resource constrained dynamics. Okay, the second type of modeling I want to talk about, hybrid modeling, is, is um, very different. Um, it also involves agent-based modeling, as you might anticipate. Um, and I think of it as, again, one of the, the single most powerful and practical techniques. And it's one we deploy for many of our models. So here you have a broader aggregate population, which is characterized in aggregate, it's it's characterized uh, without individuating people. It's characterized uh, in an aggregate form as a compartment or a stop or state variable, whatever you want to call it, one or more state variables. Um, and this aggregate population um, uh, is representing the broader population, but once individuals reach a certain level of interest, of for example, risk is often it's often associated with a certain level of risk, a threshold of risk. We focus on them. So there's a focal population here that's represented at an individual level, that's individuated, to use the term from philosophy. And we kind of zoom in on those individuals of foremost interest. But, you know, for the broader population, they're represented, but in a coarse grain sort of way. There's a coarser way. Um, so, you know, conceptually, we'll have something like a population represented, say, with stocks and flows uh, at an aggregate level maybe stratified by age groups and you know by by immigration status or or what have you by sex um but once there's a certain point a certain type of condition uh, situation developed maybe it's development of a chronic condition maybe it's infection maybe it's presentation for care, what have you, you then individuate them and you represent them as individuals. Um, and this constitutes a very nice division. You have sort of a lightweight characterization of the whole population and, and you can capture some degree of detail with it with stratification in that Sort of ungainly way you can uh, it becomes a bit ungainly with more more dimensions of stratification but really the agent population is used to give a very detailed view that can capture individual longitudinal progression and very targeted interventions and network context and geographic context and aspects of uh, care delivery and uh, reasoning about their history as it might be relevant for treatment pathways. So this sort of technique, um, like the previous one, in fact, formed the basis for much of our modeling during the pandemic. Uh, so the previous one is still in use in the SHA and is, is, is uh, one that's uh, seen a great deal of of, of leverage coming out of this uh, uh, this ABM DES representation. This one that we're talking about now formed the basis for another model that was used for province-wide capacity planning for uh, the key um, first year of the pandemic. There, there was a number of months where the capacity planning estimates depended on a model like this. 
where we had age, sex, and risk factor structured model um, that was representing transmission in the population in a compartmental way. Um, and, and then we had a downstream module that was discrete event simulation of patient flow. Um, and we had some representation of comorbid conditions and an ability to capture geography. And um, uh, you can see here the population of infected individuals and Asian population, which are sort of individuated at a certain risk at a certain point in their progression. Um, Yuan Tian was the architect of this and did a fantastic job, like all of us working, you know, untold number of hours um, to, to quickly get these models out for decision making. Um, so I like to call this sometimes lateral SD to ABM. It's horizontal. You, you have kind of individuals start in, in aggregate compartments and become agents. And, you know, you can focus a lot of and that analytic efforts and interventions and, um, and, and do uh, comparisons against empirical data, et cetera, at rich levels on the higher risk population. And yet you can represent the whole population at some level with this aggregate population. And as you might expect, and per my comments early on about flexibility, sometimes we might change where exactly in this progression individuals are individuated are turned into persons. So maybe right now it lies in the development of diabetes, but maybe we want to move it upstream to be development of prediabetes. And we'll represent everyone who has prediabetes or worse or worse dysglycemia as agents. And indeed, this has been uh, richly applied in our work with, uh, with agent-based and uh, with, excuse me, with, with modeling for dyslipidemia, for gestational and type 2 diabetes and diabetes and chronic kidney disease, et cetera. So why not do it all in dynamics? Well, really, it's so, so coarse resolution that, you know, capturing the interagent interactions or agent environment interactions um, is going to be uh, you're not going to be able to capture aspects of individual history that might form the basis for targeting interventions or changing the care pathways for an individual. Um, you're not going to be able to intervene based on their combination of comorbid conditions that they have effectively. It's kind of a, you know, a coarse representation that really often misses some of the key elements that you want for planning interventions, for comparing against empirical data that's more fine-grained, et cetera. And critically, there's, there's you know, limited ability to capture heterogeneity and poor scalability of that. Agent-based modeling by itself is also not a great, not the best solution because it'll be very computationally expensive often for larger provinces, for example, slower to build. Um, it's mostly a widely available tool set. Those in this class are learning a tool that is, um, or learning an approach that is uh, where there's a real imbalance between the need for it and the supply of people who can do it. And you'll be able to take it quite quite far career-wise if you, if you come to, to really uh, master this method. There's much demand, uh, more demand than there is supply. And you know, there's uh, with age based modeling, there's more detailed understanding of mechanisms upstream than we sometimes have. So often it's quite a nice, um, nice for our sort of uh, our model scoping, our division between what is endogenous, exogenous, ignored. If we can carve out part of this to only be represented at a coarse grain level, we don't have to go in to much greater detail for those components. We spend our efforts where they most count the population at risk. Okay, so um, 
here we had uh, two major methods that are very, very powerful, very general. I want to talk about uh, a third method that also fits into that category. And it's like the previous two from each other. It's very different from either of those. Hybrid modeling takes many forms. And this is yet another kind of orthogonal form it takes, another very different shape that it can take on. And this approach involves agents whose dynamics are in whole or in part driven by characterization using compartmental methods, using ODEs or system dynamics or, or, or state variable or continuous state variables, whatever words you want to use, kind of cognate or, or synonym, synonym terms you want to use. Uh, we characterize dynamics for agents or parts of their dynamics using, using system dynamics or compartmental tools. So let's let's load this up. Let's load up a um oh by the way, I should have loaded the other one. I, I, I stand remiss. Let me just I, I should point out if you want to see the previous one, if you want to see a sort of trivial example of it. And it's quite impoverished, but uh, go to budding hybrid SDABM model. Okay, so if we were to go do that here, um, I'll I'll just briefly put it up here. Budding hybrid uh, SDABM. So here we have non-diabetic. We have those with diabetes, but those with diabetes are created as agents. People start here. There's a thousand agents that that start in this state. Whoa, sorry, that's that's not what I want. Um, and basically, they flow down. Okay, now now I'm I'm in a pickle. Um, so I'm going to close that and reopen it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and and we'll we'll run this. So when individuals reach this point, they get created as agents. And what you'll see is those thousand people who started without diabetes, as they become diabetics, they'll be turned into agents. And and so part of the population, the part that's diabetic, will be will be agents um, represented as individuals within this population. And uh, 130, you know, 150 of them now, and the rest of them are still low risk non diabetics, for example. So that's a that's this uh, sort of budding model. They they turn into agents. They're individuated at a certain point in their risk continuum. I'm going to close this, and we will now go to this next next type, where we have uh, agent dynamics driven by continuous stocks and flows. So we're going to open a model and it's going to be called CTL state variable, use any logic seven. Okay. Uh, CTL state variable, use any logic seven. There we go. Okay. That's not an order. It's a silly name. Okay. Uh, so So this model uh, is one we've also seen before. I'm not going to spend too much time with it. I may not have, I didn't emphasize it too much as a hybrid model. But here we have agent dynamics being driven both by discrete processes. So um, there's discrete dynamics, whether or not they're living or dead. And there's continuous dynamics uh, as defined by the count of free variants and the number of uninfected cells and infected cells and cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, uh, sites represented here, uh, representing the immune response. We've talked about this before, so I'm going to go lighten my description. 
but the basic idea is that free variants infect cells, infect uninfected cells, and become infected cells. The presence of infected cells simulates growth of the immune system defenses and immune memory as represented by Z. Uh, the CTL, uh, the cytotoxic T lymphocyte state variables, the CTLs, those, the presence of those kill off, um, kill off the, uh, uh, the infected cells. Um, infected cells that are not killed off release free variants. And the key thing is that variants can come in from neighbors. And if a person uh, ends up having too high a level of vir free variants, it can kill them. So there's a fatal viral level threshold by which if their viral load, their load of this goes too high, they will die. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have here, this is a, an ancient model, which relates to a whole line of our modeling, uh, of course, published that, um, that, that leveraged this very early on before 2010 and or around uh, up to around 2010. And um, here we have a radius that's based on of their circle, based on their immune memory. And we have a color that is based on how their level of uh, of free variance. Um, so we're going to run this with a high beta a fatal viral threshold. It, in other words, it would take a lot of virus to kill off a given a given individual here. Um, and uh, we put individuals in networks. And here we see the infection spread across the networks. It infects others. Those others undergo uh, viral dynamics, which builds up their free virion levels, turns them red. Their immune system responds, makes the, uh, the circle larger in response. And that allows them to control the infection and for them to slowly uh, so they recover homeostasis, but they retain their immune memory for a while. And so even as this is shrinking, they have a lot of immune memory left that prevents uh, a very severe reinfection. Okay. Um, and, um, and there's some statistics across the population um, that are computed. So one of the advantages of this, one of the motivations was to be able to look at individuals with different levels of uh, immunocompetence and see individuals at high risk of, for example, uh, infection and how, how, um, how they would fare within a network where, where this was the model. And we were very interested in the impacts of vaccination and waning of vaccination in a way that's very contemporary. And in fact, this model allowed us to look at some of these issues being widely discussed now, like immunity gaps, whereby, you know, strict public health measures might lead to immunity to decline below levels that otherwise wouldn't have, and, and, and which could lead to vulnerability to future infection. Um, if one, by contrast, uh, with this high viral load threshold had a medium one, you'd find some individuals ending up ending up uh, not surviving the infection. And that ends up fragmenting the network uh, and, and can lead to then impaired further spread of infection. So it can, it can stop the infection from spreading. So the basic idea here should be pretty clear. We have people evolving according to this. And, and there's a number of publications that, that we have that use this to strong insight for diseases that are more theoretical or diseases that are very practical like uh, chlamydia trachomatis, um, uh, one of the most prevalent, perhaps the most prevalent um, bacterial uh, STI. So some key benefits, you have theory within an individual. So that model there was, was from public work uh, uh, by, by lab scientists, which lead to you know, uh, a theory that we capture as uh, in this method with stocks and flows, just as there's many theories, you know, physiologically articulated by Guyton and others 
uh, Doug Gaetano on um, on dynamics and uh, uh, my colleague uh, Diane Feingood and others for diabetes or, or glycemic dynamics, et cetera. Um, so you can have theory-driven models. It's declaratively specified. It's, it, it's quite crisp. And uh, you can look at this interplay between epidemiology on the one hand and um, immune system dynamics. So we like to call it immunoepidemiology. So heterogeneity and immunocompetence affects likelihood of getting infected, duration of infection, severity of infection, likelihood of transmission. All these things we've seen during the pandemic, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, were, were, I mean, those are things that, that were a key interest and we were investigating this back in 20, 2007, 2008, 2009. Looking at, uh, at other dynamics, not outside the infectious disease area, uh, changes in weight and weight norms. That's some of our work right now with diabetes and, and weight dynamics uh, over time and how it affects uh, dynamics associated with, uh, uh, with, with glycemia and, uh, and insulin um, and coevolution of pathogen reservoirs and, and, and individual health. Um, there's a number of other models uh, that uh, that I'd, I'd love to show, but in the interest of time, we're gonna have to go light. Maybe I'll show one more here for this. Um, uh, and it has to do with uh, dynamics of pathogen reservoirs. So if we close this one, we're gonna go and open up another example model. And specifically, it's going to be this environmental contamination hybrid model, okay? And this too will be one of these models having interplay of agents on the one hand and within agents will be continuous dynamics driven by stocks and flows. Um, uh, like the last model, not everything is driven by stocks and flows in terms of the dynamics. You can have state charts, for example, and events and messages as our classic and and agent based modeling and, and networks between people, but you can um, you can capture these uh, this representation of continuous dynamics using stocks and flows. So here, if we go look, we'll have the main environment, and the main environment will consist of homes, workplaces, and population. The population here will be composed of persons. And the persons here are in uh, one of three health states, susceptible, shedding, and recovered. And as you might expect, the shedding state will lead them to build up pathogen around them. Think norovirus or think cholera, where you might have fecally shed um, uh, virus uh, that, that ends up contaminating the environment. You can be infected through the environment or be infected uh, person to person. And then people move between home and work, or you can imagine in separate ones, we can work uh, between home and school back and forth. So these people are placed in a broader environment, as I said, of workplaces and homes, and there's an initial infection that takes place. And the key point here is that workplaces and homes each have a pathogen reservoir. So there's some buildup of pathogen in these environments um, that can put people at risk of getting affected by that pathogen. The pathogen dies out over time and it builds up from people who are shedding on a per capita shedding rate where the amount of shed pathogen in a given environment per unit time is the per capita shedding rate times the count of infected population uh, who, are, who are at that location, agents who are, who are at that location right now. So if we run it with a, um, let's say a medium small population, again, we, we need to move on to another method here, but. I think you'll get the, the gist of it by seeing this. You will see 
uh, these individuals placed in homes and and then there are these workplaces which are shown as factories and people go back and forth from one environment to the other. Um, so they go to the factory during the day and then they'll go back home at night. And the problem is if the factory is contaminated, they could bring the infection back to home. Or if it, their home is contaminated, they could bring it to work, shed it where it could infect other people. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, and we could of course go look at the, for example, workplaces. And we, what we would see is a buildup, for example, of infection, and then a die down during the, the night when nobody's at the workplace and then a build up during the day and die down during the night. And, and that will continue for a while and then until there's some sort of um, eventual decline in the population as a whole potentially or, or the individuals in the homes of individuals coming there and you can see it getting under control. Okay, so here we have homes and workplaces both being subject to pathogen reservoirs, et cetera. Um, so again, dynamics articulated with stocks and flows. Um, and, uh, and then uh, you have a broader environment of agents uh, that, that, that are characterized by those uh, dynamics in whole or in part. Um, very nice ability to weave together things like networks and spatial location with these dynamics that are theory based um, based on socks and flows. We've done work uh, of this sort also with um, um, uh, zoonoses, things like West Nile virus, um, where you might have West Nile virus, so you might have mosquitoes and uh, birds and people within a given grid square. And then you have a uh, buildup within the mosquito population and bird population of West Nile virus. And birds can go from one area to the other as can, um, as can mosquitoes and, uh, and can bring the virus and, and can spread in, in different areas as well. Um, uh, so, so why not do it all in system dynamics? Well, capturing networks, capturing um, uh, agents who appear and disappear um, uh, is, is awkward. And it, it turns out to be very cumbersome to do it. We did some of this early work with, you know, mixing matrices and system dynamics. And it's, it's just, it's very awkward. It's very, it's quite unnatural. Um, and there's really poor encapsulation. Uh, and you don't have the flexibility that you do with agent decision-making and movement to certain environments, et cetera. Um, uh, agent-based methods alone, well, you really don't have in agent-based methods uh, alone, a, a nice declarative support for continuous dynamics. So you don't have a way of saying, you know, this is what I'm kind of describing in terms of continuous dynamics of these of these continuous variables. The best way to do that is to weave in, at least conceptually, elements of stocks and flows, um, uh, rather than putting together some some code. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, do you want to read it? Yeah, great question. These these patterns, yeah, you could mix them together. Um, there's really no reason you couldn't. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you could have the first and the second uh, represented, for example, that the agents who are turned, the people who are turned into agents at a certain level of risk that interact um, in in the population as agents, but they go to services. And in fact, quite a few of our published press, um, published works do exactly that. They combine them together. Um, you could uh, have system dynamics driven agent evolution together with service delivery and agents in the population. We have other models like, like that where 
It's again, tripartite model, DES, agent-based system dynamics, all in one model, combining these two, but it can be very easily combined with that. So yes, these are not mutually exclusive, nor are they collectively exhaustive. There's actually others that could be used as well. I, I, uh, I'm i gonna go lightly through um, two others. So another is agents drive aggregate system dynamics models. Um, so here we have agents and the agents are circulating and maybe they drive a higher level model. Um, so maybe you have agents representing companies, tobacco companies or companies promoting, you know, fizzy drinks, uh, you know, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and uh, they are competing to draw the attention of consumers and um, and that may lead to consumers progressing in terms of health risk uh, or, or health state. Um, and here you have agents at the lower level and, and uh, stocks and flows at the, the higher level. Um, you know, another example might be, uh, you know, uh, health economics related factors. And I'll show, show a model through that. The higher level characterization might characterize policy dynamics or climate change, and it's affecting um, and being affected by decisions of agents. Or maybe you have water levels, and these agents are maybe consumers making decisions about water usage, which ends up affecting this overall environment and to some degree is affected by it because of pricing, et cetera. So let's go look at example of that basic health economics, ABM. So it's uh, this guy here. So we're gonna close this one and we'll open up uh, a health economics one. So the idea here is, is a quite powerful one. This is certainly by no means the only way to represent it, but we have individuals individual persons in, in a uh, population, as you might expect. The individual persons are tracked. And of course, this is a little teaching example, but uh, so we have very stylized representation of progression of this glycine one. So uh, pre-diabetics, type two diabetics, those with end-stage renal disease and those with transplant. And people have mortality flows. Obviously, this would be a lot more compelling if you have networks of these people with different norms affecting physical activity levels or 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 um, uh, dietary practices or what have you. But simple idea: people represented as agents. And what's notable is that, uh, in accordance with activity-based costing ideas, in each of these categories, you have a certain number of costs per year. So for example, those with diabetes might have $2,000 per year of cost, say from a societal perspective, we won't keep track of who's paying. Um, uh, or you know whether it's the healthcare system or them out of pocket. But maybe end-stage renal disease for peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis, you're getting $50,000 a year. And transplant, you're getting maybe some smaller number of costs per year. I think it's more than that. Um, so you have costs and you also have quality of life being maintained in each of these states, which is important for health economists and reasoning about um, cost effectiveness of health interventions and not only wanting to add years to life, but add life to years, um, you know, improving quality of life, for example. Um, but uh, beyond these you also have certain events like the occurrence of a transplant, which will impose costs just as an event. So the fact that someone is transplanted might cost $75,000 for a kidney transplant in Canadian dollars. And that is directly added to costs. So up here in Maine, we have or down Maine, we have um, a set of stocks and flows and these flows accumulate up the discounted costs. And they do so by 
by um, in both an undiscounted and discounted way um, by figuring out the new cost per year. And this is computed with what's called a statistic. Those who are at the tutorial on Monday will probably remember statistics live in the population. And so if we were to go look at the population and we could go look at statistics here, and we see this a computation new cost per year. And all it does is it sums up over the population, the, the cost per year borne by that population member, okay? It sums it up over the population and, and that accrues a certain cost per year, which is then accumulating in, it's flowing in, it's being accumulated by, it's being integrated up by this, um, uh, by this stock here. And then there's some intervention costs that's also being added in, I'm not gonna get into, but capturing effects of interventions. So as you run this thing, as you run this model, uh, let's say for the baseline, what you will, oh, 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 uh, uh, okay, I didn't, I was a bad boy, I didn't, color for state, okay, look at that, oh man. Um, uh, okay, so, what is it? Uh, okay, normal glycemic. Uh, person dot normal glycemic. Okay, ain't that interesting? Oh, I know what's going on. Okay, this is an ancient model. Okay, yes. So poor. So normal glycemic was probably described as an enum back in the day, and now we have optionless. Okay, well, I'll I'll end up uh, fixing that. I'm not going to do it here in the interest of time. We just need to stick in an option list that captures those different possibilities, I think. Um, it used to be defined in an older way as, uh, using what's called an, an enum. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, right. Yes, indeed. That indeed looks to be the case. Okay. So, so there we have accumulations of these um, of these quantities over time, in a way that uh, is uh, is totaling them up at the level of stocks and flows. So we have costs accruing at the higher level, undiscounted, discounted, etc., and they are being driven by an agent population's health status. That's a little bit of a passive way in which they they impact the upper level. Often they'll be reciprocal ways. Like the higher level, again, they use water and 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 there's water pricing imposed on the the agents and the population. There's a bidirectional relationship there. Um, so why not use each method alone? Well, um, you know you can. And, and system dynamics, as, as we said earlier, this kind of coarse representation, compartmental stock and flow modeling is kind of coarse, doesn't capture things like networks, it's not great at geographic or, or, or less structured or, or sort of irregular structured um, spaces, uh, and agent agent interactions can't be captured as well in an aspect of agent history, and it's not very good at capturing heterogeneity which is often of strong interest in, a, in, in certain health economics models. Agent-based models here um, allow us to, to, to uh, focus nimbly on agents, but we can capture higher level dynamics very elegantly and sometimes with greater computational efficiency, although that's more arguable with uh, stocks and flows. So the final thing is aggregate system dynamics drive agent population. And I mentioned that earlier, but the idea here is, suppose we had mosquito and, and bird dynamics at the population level. So we have stocks and flows from mosquitoes and birds. Um, and, and we capture that at an aggregate level because it would be reliably too computationally expensive to simulate all the mosquitoes at an individual level. That's not something that's uh, in the cards. Um, and it's not something that would confer value. Um, 
but you can capture dynamics of, say, West Nile virus uh, in a stock and flow model um, uh, very, very nicely. And in dead end populations like horses uh, or and, uh, and mosquitoes and birds res as a reservoir species, the birds. And then these uh, dynamics then affect agents, people within the population who are circulating and who are diverse, who are heterogeneous. Uh, some have certain comorbid conditions, some are immunocompromised due to transplant, being transplant recipients. Um, there are different levels of age. They have um, different, different levels of immune strength. And this is extremely important because West Nile virus um, uh, can inflict great harm on people who with weaker immune systems uh, can cause things like acute fal fl acute flaccid paralysis, um, encephalitis, meningitis, um, and even death uh, for agents who are of a certain type. Um, for most agents, most people, it may be quite mild in terms of its uh, risk. So, uh, here we can have people represented as agents, maybe even use people for the most at risk population, um, you know, using this sort of model, um, this sort of idea um, for the most at risk population and have other people represented in aggregate. But you have these folks being bitten by the mosquitoes represented in a compartmental form. And their evolution as individuals reflects those interactions. Okay, um, so just a few concluding remarks here uh, as I need to wrap up. So hybrid system science methods offer benefits exceeding those of any, any one model. And um, uh, for some of these models, there really is a bit of a sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, but you know, a key benefit of these models is actually a benefit to modeling process. It's the capacity to readily evolve model boundaries with learning. Um, and there's different subsets of these system science methods with agent-based modeling have a particular place of honor um, to be configured in different ways to speak to different research contexts. Agent-based modeling being particularly well-suited to interfacing with system dynamics on the one hand or with discrete event simulation. So again, that keystone role it can play. Um, and you know the, the need here is to select modeling methods according to the needs of different model subdomains and to, to pick consciously to weave together different types of modeling that, that could evolve where needed. Um, and finally, you know, uh, to really understand the contributions of hybrid modeling, you want to speak to those who are experienced uh, in applying it, who have, who have the authenticity of uh, applying that broadly um, for many, many different projects and being able to um, uh, objectively ascertain uh, its trade-offs to be to be simpler single single method approaches. So hybrid modeling is one of those elements of what I would term the modeling frontier for agent-based modeling. Um, next time for this class, I'll be talking about modeling frontiers involving agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling has evolved dramatically over the 32 or so, 32 plus years I've been using it. Uh, and it's evolved um, in some areas more so than others. Uh, and next time I'll be giving you from the perspective of someone who's an extensive user of this approach, as well as someone who has contributed methodologically over those decades to its advance, sort of a bird's eye look at what I consider some of the biggest lines of avenues for advancement in agent-based modeling and 
uh, if we were to look out five years, 10 years, 15 years, where you might expect significant action, significant advantages um, to be secured, significant progress to be made. So that'll be for next time, frontiers of agent-based model. Okay. In the meantime, I look forward to working with you uh, on your projects, including immediately for office hours. Oh, one final thing. I did state that I will be continuing to hold uh, office hours uh, after the last, last session of class, uh, which is next week. So I'm going to be posting a set of timings for the office hours. Wherever possible, I'm gonna to try to adhere to the same schedule of office hours, keep it at the same time. But there will be some days where likely I'll need a slightly different timing because of conflicts. So I will be posting a schedule of those for anyone who'd like to, to join in. And I will be holding set office hours up to, but not including December 20th. Okay. So thank you very much, and I will open office hours.